Despite its massive size, the legendary Bigfoot creature is said to have a special talent for hiding. How? Well, some recent encounters in California suggest the creature may have developed a habit of climbing trees to avoid detection. It's 2020 on a trail in the San Gabriel Mountains in Southern California. A hiker spots something odd nearby and starts recording. From a high vantage point, we see a craggy mountain in the distance. Suddenly, the camera zooms in on one of the nearby evergreens. Partway up the trunk, something or someone seems to be staring back. There's a figure right here, and it definitely appears to be a hominid shape. You see a head, what appear to be shoulders, and two arms, and possibly even two legs. And the figure appears to be maybe 15 or 20 feet up in the tree. Usually, Bigfoot sightings are associated with the northern part of the state, but it's not out of the question down south. The Southern California mountains are amazingly remote and staggeringly rugged. That area is perfect Sasquatch habitat. It just so happens that three years earlier, another sighting was reported just 60 miles from here in the San Bernardino Mountains, which doesn't surprise field researcher Cliff Barrickman. There are a small number of credible reports of rather large Sasquatches being up in trees or having been seen jumping down from trees. They have the shoulders, the hands, the arms. They're strong. They can pull themselves up. I mean, humans can climb trees, and Sasquatches are just better built humans, essentially, at the end of the day, way more apey than we are, and we're apes. Bigfoot is, by definition, big. Some say they grow to be 800 pounds. Could they really climb a tree and hang up there without breaking those branches? Or is this something else? Let's have our experts scale this mystery. At first viewing of the sighting in the San Gabriel Mountains, anthropologist Kathy Strange says the potential creature does resemble this famous alleged Bigfoot caught on camera in 1967. I believe what you see in this video matches perfectly with the shape of a Bigfoot the body shape, the face shape matches perfectly. Professor Jeff Meldrum, however, says it is highly unlikely an adult Bigfoot would display this type of arboreal behavior. There are no resources that would lure an adult up there. As far as an omnivorous primate in a temperate northern hemisphere forest, most of the carbs and sugars are in the understory or underground as roots and tubers and rhizomes and so on. The position of this creature in the tree suggests it would have to be on the smaller side. The possibility of uh, tree climbing in Sasquatch would be largely constrained by size. Just as bear cubs go shooting up a tree to escape danger, but as adults, at least uh, brown bears are much less likely to be going up trees. Zoologist Roxy Furman says perhaps this is a different, smaller animal altogether. The animal that it looks most similar to is the chimpanzee. While there are no wild chimpanzees known to California, there is one high-profile chimp once known to this area. There was a story about a chimpanzee called Mo who escaped in 2008 and hasn't been seen since. An intriguing possibility, but the chronology makes the Mo theory a stretch. At the time of escape, the chimpanzee was 42 years old, which is already massively pushing the upper limit for chimpanzees. This video, which has taken many years on, would make the chimpanzee about 60 years at the time. If that chimpanzee was still alive at 60, it would be a shock to science. OK, so unlikely that it was Mo. And according to biologist Floyd Hayes, perhaps not something living at all. The one thing that we don't see is this, whatever it is, moving. It appears to be perfectly still. One arm appears to be much thicker than the other arm, as you can see here. I think it's uh, very possible that this is some sort of an optical illusion. It could be resulting from a weird shadow or from branches or something, rocks in the background. There's no question that our minds sometimes play tricks on us. But if Bigfoot does exist, then we have to assume smaller, lighter juveniles exist that could climb trees. So for now, our verdict, this is an unidentified animal. July 5th, 2020, Big Bear, California. Experienced UFO spotter Eddie Garcia sets up under the stars with a group of friends. So we're 20 miles away from civilization, and I really wanted to show the new guys in our group ET craft. Eddie says he called out to the ETs with his mind. And amazingly, they came. 
You see? They're flying at night. So I was kind of r running the laser alongside with the ET craft so that our friends can follow along and see the craft for themselves. But instead of just pointing out whatever is flying, this happens. And now he's turning. Ooh, yeah. Flashed. Yeah, you see him? Yeah. Let's back up. Zoomed in and slowed down, the laser actually lights up the object, and it responds by making a sharp turn. Eddie, the man behind the laser pointer, is an active member of a movement called Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, or CE5. They believe they can initiate contact with aliens through a special kind of meditation and a phone app. Others have meditated in an effort to summon UFOs, most notably on a large scale in 1987. That August, tens of thousands of people gathered at 250 sites in an event called the Harmonic Convergence. A version of the idea lives on in CE5. We show peaceful interaction with uh, extraterrestrial species, and we show that there's nothing to be afraid of. For Eddie, the search for contact has been life-changing. I'm doing something bigger than myself. I think more positive about life. I kind of feel like I have purpose again. The CE5 movement has become a worldwide phenomenon with thousands of people from America to Australia meeting to summon UFOs. But is it really possible to trigger events in the material world simply with the power of the mind? And what exactly did Eddie capture on his camera? We turned the footage over to our video forensic analyst, Michael Primo. So this recording uh, had me scratching my head a little bit. So we sent the recording to MedX Forensics, which is one of our authentication tools that assesses the digital information of the file. I did not detect any evidence to support that that object was added. So the video is low resolution, but it's real. Astronomer and video effects designer Mark D'Antonio tries to narrow down what this object could be. Some people think that things like this could be aircraft, but bam, they get hit by a light and it shifts immediately to another location. That's not something an airplane can do. Our aviation expert, Lieutenant Tim McMillan, thinks we can rule out another human-made flying object. We don't see any of the other characteristics that would go with drones, all of the different warning lights that are on them, all the different aviation lights. We also don't hear sounds of drones. I don't think that drones would explain this at all. D'Antonio considers a couple of non-human possibilities. Now, a UFO can fly with weird motions like this. When you actually look at the motion that it took and you look at how much of the object was illuminated by this laser, that right there tells me that the object is a very small object, like the size of my two fists together. You'll notice as it's flying through, it's doing this. It's got this pulsation going on. It's possible that we're looking at a bat right here. Here's the thing, though. There are conflicting reports about bats and lasers. One study claims they're attracted to them, but other reports say lasers repel bats. And as for the CE5 movement, D'Antonio is keeping an open mind. I can't say whether that works or it doesn't work. I won't disparage it until I actually can get more evidence for it or against it. So, UFO or bat, it's a close one. But in this case, because of the object's size and apparent fluttering motion, we're going to call this a bat, pending further evidence. But one thing is clear. Reaching out to UFOs has put Eddie in a better place. It's March 2021, shortly before 5 p.m. Residents from all over San Diego County report hearing a mysterious sound that literally rattles the entire community. Let's look at that again. The security cam footage shows a tranquil view outside the front door of a San Diego residence. Rocked by what sounds like a loud snap, almost like a huge racket has just smacked a giant tennis ball. The reverberations are so strong that they set off a nearby car alarm. Investigative journalist MJ Benayas says skyquake events have been documented for centuries. 
We have a lot of worldwide accounts of people hearing these strange, loud explosion sounds that just come out of nowhere throughout history and around the world. There are accounts in the Bible of individuals hearing sort of the booming sounds of God. In the mythology of the Iroquois, if the creator spirit was upset, it would sort of emote via a large boom sound throughout the area. Of course, some mystery booms have quirkier explanations. In December 2020, residents of one New Jersey town were experiencing what they thought were skyquakes pretty frequently. The booms were so big that their houses were shaking. The thunder spirit in this case was construction worker Rob Bukowski, who says he made this cannon from scratch using scrap metal. Three, two, one. Holy shit. People were calling and saying bombs were getting dropped. Aliens were invading. Like, they didn't know what it was, so they put it on the news. So I called. I said, hey, man, I think this is me. Benias reminds us that the Bukowski cannon, like its inventor, is a rarity. That doesn't erase the countless boom phenomena that have occurred that seemingly have no explanation. Local police got calls about the San Diego skyquake from all across the county. Adding to the mystery, seismic activity sensors didn't pick up anything at that time and location. So it's time to put our sound expert to work. This boom was around half a second in length with most of the acoustic energy below one kilohertz. Acoustic ecologist Dr. Ben Gottesman says that most of the booms people hear are the result of human activity. So first, he looks at the possibility that it could have been Tannerite, the explosive used in the growing trend of gender reveal parties. First, as we see here, the frequency spectrum doesn't match. Also, this San Diego skyquake was heard across the county. This Tannerite explosion doesn't have a radius beyond a few miles. And so we can rule out this sort of human-made explosive. Next, Gottesman wonders if this could be Mother Nature at play. Here we have a thunderclap. Similar to the San Diego skyquake, the majority of the energy is below one kilohertz. Unlike the San Diego skyquake, the sound lasts upwards of 10 seconds, whereas the San Diego skyquake was around half a second. So to me, that doesn't really line up. What about a sonic boom from a supersonic plane? Gottesman says it's possible. So here we have an explosion that lasts a little bit less than a second. And that's similar to what we see with the San Diego skyquake. But our aviation expert, Tim McMillan, thinks that's unlikely. What we heard in that video, there's nobody owning up to it. There are also regulations in place to where militaries can and can't travel excess the speed of sound to make sonic booms for the very reason, disturbing the peace. X out explosives, thunder, and sonic booms. Where does it leave us? The best conclusion we can come up to is they're a mystery. So, as we've seen, many skyquakes can be explained. But the San Diego skyquake is not one of them. It remains unsolved by local officials and the world of sound science. Our verdict? This is an unexplained phenomenon. It's May 2020, and when Alexa Walkovitz learned her mother's dog, Lala, was lost, she and her friend Anna did something you might find hard to believe. We look at our home, we pick the settings, and we just think really, really long and hard about Lala. Let's visualize in our mind us finding her. What? Well, believe it or not, it's all about an app called Randonautica. Alexa and her friends set an intention and thought of her mother's dog. The Randonautica app, which claims to direct people to a real-world encounter with those intentions, then displayed random GPS coordinates near her home in the Mojave Desert. We're walking forward, walking forward, and Anna turns to me and kind of like says, what's that? There was a little animal. Where did you come from? And I realized it was a dog. I didn't even see it. Take another look. Out of nowhere, this dog appears in the desert. 
Now, it turned out this dog wasn't her mother's. It had escaped from a nearby property. And although Alexa never found Lala, she is convinced the app taps into the power of the mind. It was kind of a healing adventure because maybe that was my dog speaking through that dog and was trying to say to you, like, listen, it's okay. Here I am to comfort you for a moment. Experiences like Alexa's made Rando Nautica the craze of 2020. In just three months, the app drew over 15 million downloads with thousands of posts on social media of people declaring their intentions. The intention for my Rando Nod journey is purple. Heading to random locations. Is that a purple house? And finding their wishes at least partially fulfilled. Like thinking of purple and then having the app lead to this backyard. This is kind of blowing my mind right now. So does the world of the mind connect with the physical world? Can Rando Nautica really manifest our intentions? We asked our friendly physicist to come up with an experiment to test it. Dr. Hakim Olushei and Dr. Michio Kaku give us our guidelines. In order to test this idea to see if it works, you have to do a lot of tests to remove the statistical uncertainties, and you have to keep very careful records of when you're right and when you're wrong. There it is. Second, when it comes to a goal, make it specific and not metaphorical. My intention was adventure and cool stuff, and this is so cool. Not something that looks pretty. Wow. No, cash. That, to me, would be a very convincing experiment. So that's just what we did, asking our test subject to declare cash as her intention. $100. $100. The app generates random GPS coordinates. Now let's see where we're going. Part of a hairbrush? So far, no cash. All right, my intention, $100. $100. Found a weird buckle thing. Our subject keeps repeating the experiment. My intention, $100. Then, at one location, no dollar bills, but... some batteries. So we didn't find any money at this location, um, but there is a bank really close to here. So you never know, maybe that's what drew me here. Like many Randonautica stories, the exact intention didn't manifest, but something kind of related. So what's happening here? Kaku believes the explanation is something called the synchronicity effect, a phenomenon where people interpret two coincidental events as intertwined. Wow. Synchronicity, for example, is you're thinking about Joe, and Joe calls you on the telephone. And you say to yourself, aha, I knew it. I'm psychic. This is kind of blowing my mind right now. But Kaku explains, while everyone remembers the occasional hits, most of the time, they're misses. You forget about them. But think of all the times when you thought about Jane and, and Harry, and they didn't call you. Our verdict, most likely coincidence, which comes from people making very general wishes like something that will make me happy. But there is a lot we still don't know about this universe. But that's what we think. What do you think?